Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And I am seeing you once again with lecture 10 of Business English. In the previous lecture, what we covered, we covered about the, uh, we covered the conventions of um, reflecting, uh, reflectory, uh, reflecting genres, and we discussed that these reflecting genres are letters, memos, and emails. And in the previous lectures, we have already covered our letters and memos. And today's talk, we are going to um, extend our understanding about writing emails. However, before we write, uh, we study writing emails. I will take you to a little workshop on um, memo writing by providing you some examples and helping you analyze uh, these uh, examples for for clarity, tone, organization, and um, uh, consistency of form uh, in writing of the memos. Um, to be precise, what we are going to cover in today's talk is going to be the email writing process, uh, structure and format, opening body, closing, and critical thinking, and 10 mistakes we um, um, sabotage uh, that can sabotage your career. Um, however, as I mentioned, before we getting into this, we will try to move into uh, the, the uh, workshop based on uh, memo writing. And this workshop will precisely talk about what's and how's of consistency of form, organization, clarity, and tone of memos. Well, when I say form, um, there are different ways um, to format a memo although you should follow some um, general guidelines um, on formatting. Um, all memorandums uh, must be consistent um, in terms of style, uh, like margins should line up to create um, clean, straight lines down um, the left side of the page, no indentation of paragraphs. Uh, section headings should all be the same size with the same font and a relative location. Uh, like if it's a New Times Roman, you have to use the same format style in all of the headings throughout your memo. Um, this brings consistency in your memo. And uh, templates for consistent format, um, it's always to remember because um, access, uh, uh, um, uh, often students get uh, confused. Like, do we have any? standard templates to follow no there there though there are some standard templates but but I, we discussed that memo is an internal the, a document of internal use so uh, it may vary from company to company according to their needs however one thing to remember is to consult a template when constructing a memorandum for a specific organization this can be a copy of a previous memo that you can consult and a guidebook um, outlining the proper forms for um, uh, inter-office correspondence. Uh, and there are, these are the things available um, um, in any office, uh, you know, which would hire you or you would like to work in, or if you want to design your own memorandum templates. And um, initial headings of your memo, as um, we have already discussed, um, I'm just, just revising these things to refresh in your understanding so we can go on and have our analysis and lateral discussion based on some memo samples. Uh, the initial headings would include date, to, from, and subject, and the, and the text of your memo. However, there can be a difference of, uh, of the basic format. Um, some companies would have uh, uh, two on the top, some companies would have date on the top, and some companies would have from on the top. Uh, that, that depends, again, it's the organizational decision, and um, if you are working in an organization that has a specific template to follow, you will have to follow that. Uh, now, um, the one thing to remember here is that each, the first letter of all major words in the, in the titles, like you can see date, to, from, subject. If you're not using an electronic memo or if you're not using an already designed template, you have to make them, you have to capitalize them. And it's not only the, in, the, in the heading titles, it's in the, in the answer titles as well. So all first letters should be um, capitalized. And again, about the subject, uh, we need to uh, we need to understand that it is not necessary that subject has to be um, a sentence all the time. You can write subject as a, as a, as a as a phrase or as a, um, you know something that is without article. And since it's a phrase or without article, um, you do not need to put a period in the end, a full stop in the end. Now, memo format, subject line. 
subject line titles um, in memos functions like um, the tiles of reports they announce the topic they tell what is going to be talked about the memo should deal only with the single subject announced in the subject line um, you cannot incorporate many uh, topics an, uh, in the text and only talk about one in the subject it's always preferable to uh, use one memo for one kind of um, information that you are either sending or receiving or want to receive remember that the title in the subject line should not substitute for an opening that provides a context for the message like you have three samples on the screen you can see that one subject says adopting telecommunicating it's a weak subject does not clarify what it means by that okay another try um, a new company practice well th this can be any type of practice what practice are you talking about again a vague subject subject has to be specific clear what your message is about so for this type of uh, task if the if it, it's written adopting telecommunicating as a new company practice it is comparatively specific and clearer in understanding so I hope that uh, the idea of subject line is uh, you know clearer uh, with this sample now a uh, suggested format for spacing and margins um, int introduction does not need a heading at all um, however in the sections if there are um, more than one the major section the major the main body of the text you can provide headings there depending on the on the on the text that you are writing uh, underneath um, if it's need one main heading and the later can later can be uh, the coming headings can be subheadings or it needs all the major headings or it needs you know uh, bulleting or enumeration that is your decision so single space between the section tiles uh, titles paragraphs and between sections and second section heading uh, continue in the, this manner until the end of the memo so conclusion does not need a heading at all because conclusion is always a summary of whatever has been discussed so far uh, in the document um, dividing a memo into sections uh, and headings why do we divide a memo well um, dividing up because our, our our objective is to communicate message with clarity so all the organizational uh, or the organize the measures of organization of the text that we take whether it's internal or external they are to add into the clarity of the meaning so divide a memo into sections to clarify your points if you have enough data to divide always remember what I'm talking about I'm talking about the possibilities available for you to decide which one suits best to your situation like if the if the memo is very simple it's hardly over one paragraph then probably you do not need sections at all you do not need headings at all however if it's a longer memo and you have several items of the same idea to talk about you can head them you can provide heads for them so when I say divide a memo it's not a religious instruction to always divide a memo it is in relevance with the need of division uh, based on the length of the text that you have the order of the sections must be logical to develop meaning as a as a well written essay um, the headings should be specific and clear to allow the reader some idea of the content of the whole memo the introduction and conclusion do not take headings like example of headings can be benefit of telecommunicating if I am taking the same uh, topic that I referred to in the in the previous slides and benefits of telecommunicating the influence of technology on telecommunicating and action needed to uh, implement change in the company and in our company in the company in company so these can be the subheadings of the of the um, talk that um, I need to do regarding the title of the uh, of the memo that I explained in the previous slides. Now, organization of content is another very important factor. I repeat once again, and I would keep on saying this throughout this course that whatsoever document you are you are composing for for business purpose it needs to have seven C's implemented right and organization um, uh, is one important factor that uh, that adds into the to, into the effectiveness of your technical writing a memo can be written in different ways um, understandable um, there is no right way to write a memo 
uh, I cannot say there is one way of write a memo or there is a standard way of write a memo because it varies from company to company, uh, varies according to the needs of the writers and readers. However, the way you choose to write your memo depends on many things including the purpose of the memo, uh, whether it's to persuade or it's to inform or it's to instruct or it's to, in, uh, you know, uh, for example, if you are, um, if you are uh, only informing then uh, maybe uh, you would like to uh, keep your to and from as a, as a top of your uh, headings on a memo. However, if it is to persuade, then to and from is, may not be of um, a great importance, but the great importance is going to be what topic you are talking about. Is it regarding a change taking place or some decision that is, that is taking place? So it depends. What are the needs of the writers and needs of the readers? And it helps you decide what format you are going to follow. Uh, and then, um, uh, organizing a persuasive memo. Well, it's very important for you to understand how can we organize a persuasive memo. Um, in introduction, like we have already discussed how many parts a memo has and how many ways a memo can be written, how many headings a memo can have, what are the formatting conventions a memo needs to follow. Now, we are particularly talking about what parts are used in a persuasive memo, what type of content inside. For example, if my memo has three parts, three body parts, like inside the body I have to provide introduction, I have to provide the main body of the message and I have to provide conclusion. What am I going to write into that? Well, in introduction uh, uh, area, I'm, I'm just, I'm not, no, I'm not touching the heading aspect of the, uh, for the format aspect of the memo, I'm talking about the text of the memo. So in the text, in the very beginning of the text when you are introducing your memo you need to state the purpose of the of the writing of the memo what is the purpose like the subject line we discussed but the subject like is done now we are not talk talking about subject like anymore we're talking about the text of the memo the paragraph or the text that you're writing and the and the following details that would that would make the body of the text can can be the you know supporting details um, should explain the issue or address uh, or address the problem being talked. If there are two sides to the issue, explain both sides. So to let the reader um, be aware of both the sides, and you know, um, then he or she will be in a position to understand uh, what side and why you are taking this side. Make your argument and explain the purpose that your argument uh, that your argument serves. If you choose one side over the other, explain why. Use examples to illustrate your point and demonstrate why your argument is the best one. And then present counter arguments or actions needed to carry out the suggested action. And in the conclusion, you restate your argument in one, two sentences because that's, that is the gist of the, of the memo and use the last sentence to state how uh, you will follow up the action needed. Restate, make it an active conclusion. And uh, again, um, I would, I would, I would um, talk about the cl clarity, the concept of clarity in memo. Because I, I told you, if your if your business documents are not clear, um, um, if it has to be a you know a one way document, if and if it's not clear, the very the very uh, much possible outcome is that it is ignored. Like for example, if I am um, sending a proposal and my proposal is not clear in its objectives and, and therefore I have not been able to provide uh, the information that was required. The proposal will not be read and eventually will not be accepted. And nobody will come back to me, um, ask me, can you please clarify your proposal because it was a one-way communication, right? And um, so it's, it's gone. However, um, so this is the this is the uh, um, negative effect associated with the lack of clarity in a, in a in a in a in a major document or a, or a larger canvas document like proposals, reports, or resumes. Uh, because a resume, if a resume is not clear, it's, it does not have clarity. Nobody will call you up. Okay, dear Mr. Mohsen, can you please send us a clear 
um, CV, we would want to know uh, about the details. No, people don't come back. So, um, what you lose here, you lose here an opportunity that may not come again. However, um, if you're writing a memo and your memo lacks in clarity, a negative outcome can be that you are you will start receiving messages you will start receiving memos in replies and then those memos will demand another memo to be generated so what you are doing you are this is costing you costing time costing energy costing more paper costing more thinking costing more words so um, well when we talk about business we need to keep in mind that in business you have to be very very clear about things so you have to budget your things so if it's a wastage of time or wastage of manpower or thinking or analytical skills you are wasting uh, something that can be done in in 10 minutes with the um, with the limited resources if it takes two hours that means it's it was not a, it was not a good deal to make or um, um, it's not the it's not a professional way to go about it so the, the the bottom line is clarity has to be sought so to write a clear memo you must avoid vague wordy sentences vague I've already given I've already given you an example what do I mean by vague where information is not complete incomplete information you see completeness one C of seven C's and then wordy sentences conciseness you have to be to the point you have to be concise you have to be pity so if you are not you are getting into verbosity you are getting into wordiness and wordiness kills the uh, kills the clarity and then if you are killing the clarity you are again there at the, at the point where you are going to have negative outcomes so to embed clarity in your text you need to avoid vague wordy sentences use specific and relevant examples to illustrate so to minimizing the um, possibility of having an ambiguous message and avoid the use of jargons and acronyms because again jargons and acronyms may create uh, generate meaning that is not intended so open up the acronyms shorter form of the words and uh, use a term that is uh, commonly understood by people of uh, by the circle that you are communicating in instead of using jargons that uh, you have you you are confused about they people may know they may not know so go for something that you're sure about that they should know it or they will know it okay now um, let us get, in, get into a one clarity exercise look at the screen and um, the following is an, 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 a, is an introduction of a memo as you read it. Pay close attention to clarity. Do you think this needs clarity or it's already clear? You can see the, the title section, the profile of the memo, to, from and subject, date is missing in this type of memo. Look at the formatting, is it alright? Probably look at the from in the title. Do we need to do some spacing here? All right. Now look at the message. Telecommunicating or the employment practice of utilizing technological advances such as the internet to enable personal or to labor from their home computers and workplaces is a flexible working opportunity that would significantly benefit our exemplary employees by giving them the option of working from home for some or even all of the time. Our wonderful organization would also benefit extraordinarily um, uh, from adopting telecommunica telecommunicating uh, as a new and improved company practice. Therefore, um, uh, chiefly, uh, chiefly because f flexible working has a very really positive effect on people, um, people's productivity and their individual professional motivation themselves. Look at the look at the sentence structure. We talked about simple sentence structure. We talked about um, cutting short on passive voice. We talked about um, uh, avoiding unnecessary wording. Our company should really highly consider should really highly consider adopting telecommunicating as a new and unique form of work options for our employees well what do you think look at these questions is this memo effective if it is not
how is it ineffective what is the problem with that and how would you change it now you might have noticed that although the memo has many problems but two major problems that we can quickly identify in terms of clarity in this particular memo is one is redundancy and other is overly complex language that is not required so how would you revise the introduction of this memo to be more clear look at the memo and your task is to revise the introduction of this memo tell the readers what are you talking about that is what we do in the introduction of the memo right so you take a while pause the video here and rewrite the introduction of this memo all right I hope by now you are done so let me take you to a revised introduction of the same memo look at the screen focus can you ch can you look at the change in the in the in the heading in the in the profile section of the memo things are aligned now okay now read the text Telecommunicating is a flexible working opportunity that would give employees the ability to work from home, um, home, some or even all of the time. Our organization would benefit from adopting telecommunicating as a new company practice as flexible working has a positive effect on productivity and motivation. So, same message with the same kind of uh, action words however we have cut short on the redundancy um, complex wording complex sentence structure and we try to write in simple language where we can communicate the message so that is the that is the idea behind asking you to uh, you know avoid uh, um, ambiguous uh, writings and ambiguous text um, an effective and clear introduction is there is this is another example telecommunicating is a flexible working opportunity that would give employees the ability to work from home some or even all of the time our organization would benefit from adopting telecommunicating as a new company practice as flexible working has a positive effect on productivity and motivation notice how the writer makes the makes the proposal he or she clearly states the purpose of the memo in the introduction and note that um, he or she does not state I propose that or the purpose of the memo is to so but the but the purpose is uh, subtly it's very sub, very very embedded in a subtle way that you can you know you understand what it, what it what intention or objective it has now clarity throughout the memo remember that a clear introduction leads to an effective opening and of course um, clarity should be mentioned and maintained mentioned in, in, a, in a way it should be it should be embedded in words and maintained throughout the body and closing of the memo as well well this was a bit about the clarity now moving on to tone of the memo and um, tone of the text that you're writing to use an appropriate tone you must specify the uh, intended message and audience determine the desired tone whether you are going to be persuasive angry accommodative formal informal um, ironic funny whatsoever like you, you have to decide what tone you want to use for your memo and once you are done with decision effectively utilize the appropriate tone through the use of language and maintain the tone throughout the throughout the text that you are producing okay let me give you an exercise for tone and we are following the same topic and the following and this example is the first section of the of the previous memo we looked at think about its tone read the text the heading is benefits of telecommunicating I think telecommunicating is a usually good option especially nowadays first many people uh, work so they don't have a lot of time to spend with their family but if we have were to offer employees in our company the option to telecommute to work they could spend more time with their family while working 
So for example, let's say a working mother wants to raise her kids herself without a babysitter. She could do that if she had the option to telecommute. All right. Now, when you are analyzing the aspect of tone, what are the questions you should consider? Well, what tone is used here? What do you think? Is this written to an equal, a subordinate or a supervisor? Who is the audience? What is the status of the audience? And once you are done with figuring out that, if it is addressed to a super superior, how would he or she react? Is this, the, is, this, is this an appropriate way of addressing a superior? If it is addressed to a co-worker, does it use an appropriate tone? All right. So, uh, the com some comments that uh, I can give you on that is that um, you definitely would have noticed that the memo is informal in tone. I think telecommunicating, the very first a uh, few words of the of the sen of the of the paragraph tells you tell you that it's informal it's 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 causal it's casual it's forceful in other words it is written to an equal perhaps a co-worker so um revisions needed to write to a superior if you're writing this memo to a superior how would you revise the same text a memo to a co-worker who is also a friend can be informal, understandable. However, a memo to several readers or to a superior such as a superior or a manager should be formal. How would you revise the memo section to address a superior? Now that's your task. Take five minutes and rewrite the same text but now your audience has been changed. Your audience is not your co-worker anymore. It's your superior, probably your immediate boss or your manager. How would you revise it? Well, look at this revised version. Addressing a superior this time. In today's society, look at the beginning. Many working men and women face poverty of time. As a result, some individuals are reluctant to work and want to spend more time with their family. However, offering both current and potential employees the option of telecom telecommuting to work would allow them to arrange their time around their work instead of their workplace. For instance, a mother who wants to raise her kids herself and pursue a career can do so by working at home instead of at the office. Look at the formal tone, how it is embedded in the usage of language, the words, and the way the sentence structures are formed. Now, this was about tone, and we are going to talk about now the audience. To argue your point effectively, you must consider your audience. Now understand how the audience is likely to feel about the information. How are they going to react on the information? Find common links um, with your audience and consider what you want the audience to feel about the information. If you understand all these aspects, you'll be in a better position to give your text uh, uh, what it is required. Now examples to illustrate your point. Once you know your argument, the tone you will use and the audience you will address, use examples to illustrate your point. Now, look at this text on the screen. How examples are used here? Notice how this example helps illustrate the benefits of telecomm telecommuting, whether or not the intended audience is a working mother, the reader is likely to understand the need for parents to spend time with their children. So, it's a kind of example that addresses to the audience that I am targeting. Maybe my audience is, uh, my audience is uh, my audiences are female workers and most of them are mothers. How appropriate this example is going to be? Even if they are not mothers, they are, they are, mix, uh, they are mixed genders and they are parents, even then, this, though this will not be a perfect example, this will do good with the audience. Right? Because uh, being parents, they understand the concerns of both the genders, males and females. 
So, illustration always makes, serves the purpose of clarifying and justifying your actions, whatsoever is needed. Alright, now after going through this exercise, I would expect my students to research and find out advantages of telecommuting and come up with real life examples to support your claim. I want you, all of you to write two claims at least to support if you are writing this memo. How can telecommuni telecommuting benefit employees and why should we adopt this technology? Well, now um, the last bit, how to counter argument. The following is the last section in the memo before the conclusion. Action needed to implement change. Why do we need this action to implement change? How do I present my argument? Well, look at the text. It says that the company will have to make some, expect, some uh, exceptions in this new policy. So there is a change in the policy. First, some job functions cannot be performed through telecommuting and must be completed in the office. Furthermore, employees who feel more productive in the office should not feel pressured into adopting this practice. However, once an employee considers this option and decides that his or her working space at home does not hinder productivity, the organization can give the employee the option to telecommute. All right, now notice how the, how the writer presents um, counter argument but then claims that certain exceptions must be made in this new policy and such exceptions and counter arguments should generally come in a new section after making your argument for all right so now what you are going to do the second exercise of this workshop for you is that you're going to write a possible conclusion to the telecommuting memo that we have discussed so far starting from its introduction then the sections inside after the introduction following till the conclusion and I'm leaving this conclusion part for you because it's not it does not have to be new altogether you will pick up the important things from all the sections and it will form your conclusion keep my keep these things in mind that you have to restate the argument in one and two sentences and use the last sentence to state how you will follow up with the issue. So this is your task to write concluding section of this memo. All right. Uh, I give you one example of an effective conclusion. Uh, by considering employees' flexible working needs and implementing suitable technologies, the organization would benefit from adopting telecommuting as a new company policy or new company practice. I will be happy to discuss this policy with you and will contact you next week so that we can work to implement this policy. You can see how the last sentence state, how are we going to follow this up. Well, this was all for uh, today's workshop on memo writing and we are done with this, our memo writing topic. Now we are going to focus on the next um, uh, uh, item on the list, that is email writing. Well, that's what we do all the time, don't we? We are writing emails. Most of them are informal, but some of them are very formal as well. And for, for professional, they are writing formal emails almost all the time. So let's see what an email is about. Email messages, what we are going to discuss in that is the writing process, smart email practices, structure and format, and the typical email and memos. We, we have to move between memos and letters and emails too, so, to, so you can understand what are the things that mark difference between these three types of documents. Well, the writing process of email, um, like all other documents, we have to follow four-step process, pre-writing, analyzing, anticipating, and adapting. Now, um, pre-writing with the questions we need to consider, do I really need to write? Email or hard copy memo, what should I go for? Well, um, why am I writing? What is the purpose? I need to consider my purpose. How will the reader react? Well, I need to anticipate how the reader is going to react because I may need to incorporate this information into my email. How can I save the reader's time? Not only reader's time, but the writer's time because something may come up as a reply. For that, I need to write a whole thing again. 
and because that may come up with the lack of clarity that I embed in my text in my email so the writing process the pre-writing things the pre-writing questions should be these to make you plan what you are going to write about how you're going to write about and how you're going to deal with these situations now the second step is writing in writing the three things that we are going to pay attention to is writing uh, researching organizing and composing now how do we do that we check files to research we collect information uh, we collect study relevant documents we make an our outline to organize information and we write our first draft to start our composition however the third step of writing is revising when I'm done with writing my first draft I need to revise my text revising in revision what we do we edit we proofread and we evaluate so we revise for clarity I hope this this concept of clarity is clear now uh, we revise for correctness we revise for all seven C's that we have discussed so far in our in our course we plan for feedback one very important thing now emails and memo structure and format we we know that the format of a memo is something like this you have um, um, a profile section of a memo with date to from and subject and you have opening body and closing part in the text of the memo now it's almost the same in the email the difference is that email is an electronic version of the paper f format you see the subject lines your vacation request deadline it can be a phrase without a period in the end and all the first letters of all of all the words are capitalized sending visibility report the heading of your memo summarize the main idea and use nouns and phrases not complete sentences now the opening of your memo that is electronic memo email start directly amplify the main idea indirect openings are to avoid like one indirect opening can be this is to inform you that we must complete the annual operating budget smoothly over the past two months many supervisors have expressed concern about their departmental budget needs and a direct opening can be look at who is being targeted all supervisors and coordinators and will we'll meet June this at this time to work out the annual operating budgets for all departments now talk about the body and in body when you're writing body you need to consider these things explain and discuss the topic introduce relevant details or examples use graphic highlighting a uh, highlighting to enhance reading comprehension and retention because that is very important consider columns headings numbered or bullet list and so forth and when you are doing closing for your electronic memos that are emails you need to consider to end the message you have the following options action information dates or deadlines to meet to tell the to tell the audience that this is to make summary of the message and closing thought now formatting hard copies of memos or the electronic emails look at the formatting thing it's it's three paragraph memos look at the introductory paragraph to speed telephone installation and improve service within the main facility we are starting a new application procedure so the idea the first uh, section of the memo clearly explain the, explains the idea service request forms will be available at various locations within the three buildings when you require telephone services pick up a request from at your nearest location fill in the pertinent facts obtain approval from your division head and send the forms to Bernard White all the instructions are given clearly 
please call me in the follow-up section, the last thought you're leaving your readers with. Please call me at this number if you have any questions about this new procedure. All right, you can sign your initials if you want to after from. Um, two inch from the top, look at the date section. Um, look, at the, look at the margins you are taking care of when you are having a, a paper copy of the electronic memo. You are going to print it. One inch for e from each margins. Two blank line between subject and um, uh, text main body. If you are printing uh, an email, this will be automatically embedded. However, if you are designing it on the, on the computer, you need to uh, embed these spaces manually. And then align items two spaces after subject. Either you press space bar for two times, your space bar, can you see the space bar here? It's a long bar on the on the on the keypad. Or if you press the tab button, this is the tab button. Tab. If you press it once, your cursor will automatically go two spaces next to where you are right now. And one blank line between your date to and from and the subject. After date, you leave one blank line. After two, you leave one blank line. So these are blanks between the uh, main headings. All right, look at this memo. Will you call this, this an effective example or an ineffective example? I want you to read this uh, memo and list down the reasons why would you call it effective or ineffective. And look at these questions. What is the purpose of routine request? How effective is the subject line? Is the opening direct or indirect? What does the writer want the reader to do? How should the memo begin? What should be in the body? What highlighting techniques could be used? And what should be included in the closing? Should a reason be given along with an end date? So consider all these questions and then form your answers in order to have, let you have revision of the memo. Now look at this. What do you think? What do you think about this memo? Do you think it's, a, it's an effective form of memo or an ineffective memo? Well, if you think it's an effective memo, again I would want you to consider all those questions and form your reasons to call it effective or ineffective. Alright, let's move on. Formatting email messages. Look at this email image copied from computer. Look at um, the um, profile section. It has CC and BCCC. CC mean a copy of the text, a carbon copy. And BCC is blind carbon copy. CC is, oh, we serve the purpose that if I am writing this email to um, Sarah and I want um, um, Josephine, who is the, uh, who is the, who's related with this uh, matter that we are discussing, I want her to know that we are having this, uh, um, you know, uh, correspondence. I will CC this to Josephine and send this to Sarah, so we three are in the loop and we three will receive the same email. Now, Sarah knows that I have sent this to Josephine and Josephine, Josephine knows that we are having this correspondence. So we all three know it, that we, have, we are in the loop. Now, BCC blind carbon copy is that I send it to Sarah, 2 is, a, is, is Sarah, Sarah's address, but I send a blind copy to, to Josephine. Josephine will know the correspondence is between uh, me and I and Sarah, but Sarah will not know that I have sent this copy to Josephine too. So in certain situations when you do not want your direct recipient to know about the copy that you are sending to somebody, you use blind carbon copy. And this um, uh, attached option shows the attachment if you have attached any. If you have any attachments to go with the, with the memo or the email, uh, you, you can see those attachments written here in black and white. 
you can see the the you know format of your email the spaces in between look at the space after salutation space after uh, the first part paragraph second paragraph third paragraph then your uh, complimentary close look at the punctuation colon and a comma then a, a space and then the address of the sender that 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 includes name designation um, phone number fax number and email if you want to um, look at single space body double space between paragraphs write complete sentences and use upper and lower case letters appropriately because at times emails are not set for automatic grammar check spelling check or punctuation check if you are in habit of um, leaving and doing these um, careless uh, things then you better need to set your automatic check for such things on computer use angle brackets for internet addresses if you are writing them manually try to use angle brackets however um, nowadays electronically when we are using uh, updated um, uh, new windows in the market um, you write one address and it is saved in and when you write the name um, the address will appear automatically so your hassle has been has has cut short in that manner include a salutation for a friendly tone and use a complimentary close and include your contact information. Now, what is the smart email and smart email practices? Getting started, considering um, composing offline, consider composing offline. So you do not send it just like that. Compose, take a break, like think about it, reread it, evaluate it, and send, and then send. Type the receiver's address correctly and try to type it in the end. So if by mistake you send, you press on the send button, it's not there. If this address will not be, will not be there in the address bar, your, your email will not be sent automatically. Avoid misleading subject lines. Avoid misleading subject lines. Be very clear about subject lines. Apply the top of the screen test. Content tone correctness I repeat these things again and again and how can you be clear about that be concise don't use email to avoid contact care about correctness and tone and resist humor and tongue-in-cheek comments like uh, unnecessarily unless they are uh, they are important don't send anything you wouldn't want published or posted on your office door because people, uh, when you send something in black and white, like it's a record that the company is going to keep. If you think this shouldn't be a part of your record, try to go in person and talk to the person. Avoid writing an email. All right. Um, now, netiquettes. You must have heard about etiquettes. But well, what is a netiquette? It's not to do the, these things. Limit any tendency to send blanket co copies, like never send spam. Consider using identifying labels such as action, FI, RE, urgent. You need to know what do they mean and what do they meant, what are they sent for. Use, a, use uppercase only for emphasis, emphasis or titles because if you're writing in bold, that means that is considered as, you know, a bad manners as you're shouting at your, at your recipient. So always use uppercase when it is, when it is due to use. Announce attachments. If you are attaching something and you do not, um, you know, discuss about this in your text, that the reader, you know, there, there are chances that the reader may overlook that. So always if you are attaching something, make a sentence, maybe a brief one, a precise one, that please find attached documents so reader knows that there is one attachment to be looked at. Seek permission before forwarding. If you want to forward an email, you need to seek permission of the sender for forwarding it because um, this, may, this may only be for you and may not be fitting, suitable for the person who you are forwarding it to. Now, reading and replying to an email. Scan all messages before replying. Acknowledge receipts. Don't automatically return the sender's message. Revise the subject line of the topic in a series of message is a thread message. And provide a clear, complete first sentence. 
in your reply. Never respond when you are angry because these uh, um, emotional imbalance situations um, create trouble because you, when you're writing, you're writing in a subtle in a, in a set frame that you are in at the, at the time. So when you are angry, that is not a good time to reply an email that is business related. Personal use. Um, don't use company computers for personal matters unless allowed by your organization and assume that all email is, is monitored even when you connect to your ISP from work. Other smart practices would include use design to improve readability of longer messages and consider cultural differences. Double check before hitting the send button. Do I need to send it or is it ready to send or not? Use instant messaging professionally to expand your communication channel choices. Well, these are the top 10 mistakes that I'm going to talk about now that may subjugate your career. Be very clear about it. Responding when angry. Never ever respond to a professional um, a correspondence business email when you are emotionally disbalanced. Don't do that. When you are over uh, pleasured, you know, very happy, or when you are sad, when you are very angry, when you when you have these emotional, uh, you know, um, uh, emotional um, situation, when you are into some um, into some sentiments which are driving your actions, never use your, never reply your emails. But that doesn't mean don't reply your emails. You need to get back to normal state of mind and reply your emails. Making address goofs. Um, well, make a clear address where you are replying it from. Forgetting a subject line or failing to change it to match thread. Well, don't forget a subject line because it always gives the, uh, it, always, it is always the, it, the title of your, your, your text. And later on when you want to retrieve some message and find it again from your inbox, it's always easy because the, the idea is in your head and you will just write the subject and the email message will be there and you'll be able to easily find out of hundreds or hundreds of mails. Not personalize your 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 message. Uh, if it's a if it's a business message, do not personalize that. Skipping the salutation and closing um, identification. Well, that's very uh, important. Not personalize your message. And the fifth one is including inappropriate content. This can be inappropriate content. Can be irrelevant. Um, unnecessary or um, that is not adding meaning into the into the message of the of what you intend to send instant in indiscretions off color jokes and statements you will later regret are all inappropriate uh, a part of in inappropriate content um, Forgetting to check for spelling and grammar always cause issues and um, embarrass you in situations. So always try to uh, do it manually if you can. Otherwise, you can keep up a, an, an electronic check. Thinking no one less will ever see your email. No one else will. If you are sending it to, it will be read by people. So read, write it for people because they are going to read it. Copying and forwarding recklessly. When recklessly copying and forwarding is always, um, is always a risk because um, you don't know what you are doing and you don't read it so it can cause you many problems because this is going to be a record so if you're going to put something on record you have to be very sensitive to the issue completing two line first a slip of the fingers can send a message before its time and you can never take it back so do not you know complete the address line in the beginning write it in the end when expecting an instant response, do not expect an instant response. If people do it, that's you're lucky. If they don't do it, you need to be patient to wait for the response. So sender messages, message to send message to serve to server. Store server stores your message. A second computer may keep duplicates. And a receiver sends the message. So it may duplicate, print, forward, or post the message to the web. So understand the procedures.
Once the message is sent, its distribution cannot be controlled. Retained from weeks to years worth of back mail. Look at the typical request messages and these are, they are just like that we discussed regarding memos and the response messages, the, the conventions of opening body and closing and procedural messages, opening body and closing. These were, this was about the typical messages and memos. And confirmation messages would look something like this, keeping these aspects in the text. Explaining purpose of writing, um, atomizing major issues of points, and offer concluding remarks, summary, or further assistance. So, um, now, uh, we are done with the with the subject specific talk of lecture of the of the of this lecture and we are ready to have our um, uh, uh, upcoming activity that is listening activity however before we get into listening activity what we have covered so far we have we had um, we have discussed the the uh, conventions of email writing and before than that we discussed we had analytical analysis of our uh, of uh, some memos for clarity consistency tone and organization. So uh, let's move on to our next activity that is a listening exercise. I hope you're ready for it. Well, like always we are going to listen to an interview this time with Alex who is an Australian professional. So the accent that you're going to listen to is going to be Australian. So be ready. You're going to listen to the interview for the questions on the screen. Here you are. Okay, and I'm going to play the video. Pay attention. There you go. My name is Alex. I'm 30 years old. I'm originally from Vienna in Austria, and I now live in London where I train to be a solicitor, which is a type of lawyer. There are two different kinds of lawyers in England, barristers and solicitors. Barristers are the lawyers that always go to court, whereas solicitors are lawyers that deal with, the cli with clients immediately. Um, the reason why I'm in the UK is a little bit complicated because my parents are diplomats and when I was 16 we moved to Australia and that's where I learned to speak English. And after that I didn't really want to go back to Vienna immediately um, and instead I decided that I was going to study in England. And so I applied to do philosophy at the University of Oxford which was meant to have one of the best philosophy departments in England and I was accepted and so that's how I ended up there. The thing that first attracted me to philosophy was that I thought that philosophy was the kind of thing that would help you to learn how to think and that it is something that underlies all the other sciences and all the other fields of human thought. But I was also always interested in other more practical things, especially in politics and international relations. And I thought that having a philosophy, doing law and practicing as a lawyer for a while would eventually allow me to go and work for international organizations such as the European Union or the UN. And that's what I would like to do eventually. And that's why I'm now in London qualifying as a lawyer. The legal system in England is, is different from um, the legal system in, in a lot of other countries because it takes much less time to qualify as a lawyer. What you can do, in fact, is a law conversion course which takes only two years and then um, you work in a law firm for another two years until you're a qualified lawyer um, and in this period you're, you're known as a trainee solicitor um, in most other countries it takes much longer to be a lawyer in Austria for example where I'm from it can take up to 10 years before you're a qualified lawyer the law firm I work for is an international firm which means that most of our clients are spread out all over the world and that in turn means that although officially I work from 9.30 to 6 p.m., um, inofficially I can be called on to work at any time, any day of the week, um, for at times very long periods of time. So normally I come into work at between 9 and 9.30 and um, I leave if there's nothing on at 6 p.m. or if there is something on 
I can leave at 7, 8, 9, 10 p.m. or even a few times at 4 or 5 in the morning, although that's admittedly rather rare. The, the work can be very interesting, and that depends on, on who you work for and, and what, what is happening at the time. Um, and the thing is that you sometimes work on matters which are in the newspapers, in the press, and so it's, it can be quite fascinating to be in the middle of this kind of highly pressured environment. Um, but of course it's the kind of thing that a lot of people only do for a few years when you're still young and you don't really have anything better to do with your life. Um, and I don't think I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. But as an experience, it's certainly, it's certainly interesting. In the two years that I'm working for this law firm, I'm going to work, for, um, work in four different legal areas. Um, so every six months I switch. And at least one of them has to be what is known as contentious law, which basically means the kind of law where there is a conflict between people and people go to court, um, which is something that people, that lawyers tend to either, either love or hate. Um, I personally am very, find it very interesting because for some reason the idea of conflict and doing battle is something that appeals to me, but that's obviously a matter of personal preference. In, in February 2008, I'm actually going to be sent to Hong Kong for six months to, uh, to, work, to work there because my firm has, has an office there. After that, it de I'm not entirely sure. It depends on whether or not my firm will want to keep me on. And if they do, then I, it is the likeliest outcome is that I'll be working in London or that I will stay in Hong Kong for a little while. But alternatively, it's also possible that I will, come, I will try and find, a work, find work with a different firm if there is a particular area of law I want to work in that I cannot do at my current firm. Or that I will try and make a move, make a, make, make a switch to to an international organization, which is something I kind of want to do eventually anyway, but um, maybe not straight away. I'm not sure if I want to come back to London or not. Um, London is a very interesting city, but it also has some disadvantages. It's very, very expensive, and um, it's, I find sometimes quite difficult to meet your friends there because it's so big that it can take a very long time just to get from one part of London to another. As far as working in the UK is concerned, I think, well, what I like is that in England, there seems to be a certain perception of fairness and the need to be fair in the workplace, which is something that I think you don't get in all countries and something very nice. I think it's, I, I know quite a few people who are solicitors who are not native English speakers, but I, th I think you do need to have a good grasp of English. Um, I think lawyers need to be good with language, but it's certainly not impossible. And the advice I would give is just to, I mean, it can be a very rewarding profession, but it's also a, a profession that requires a lot of commitment. And you just need to be sure that you want to give it the kind of equipment that it requires. Because it takes years to train. You know, first you need to do a course, you need to do another course, then you need to work as a trainee for two years. Then you're then, uh, you qualified. So it, it takes a long time and you just need to make sure that it's the right thing for you. Well, if I weren't doing this job, I think I, think I would like to be a lion tamer. It requires a lot of similar skills. Um, you need to deal with some very unpleasant creatures and people, individuals, and uh, you need to stay calm in, in, when there is a lot of pressure. All right, here you are. I hope you are done by now with the very first question. And now you are going to listen to uh, the part of interview, and you will focus on the, the six question, the five questions, listing from uh, listed as 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th and 6th. So I play the interview. My name is Alex. I'm 30 years old. I'm originally from Vienna in Austria and I now live in London where I train to be a solicitor which is a type of lawyer. There are two different kinds of lawyers in England, barristers and solicitors. Barristers are the lawyers that always go to court whereas solicitors are lawyers that deal with, with clients immediately. Um, the reason why I'm in the UK is a little bit complicated because my parents are diplomats and when I was 16 we moved to Australia and that's where I learned to speak English. And after that I didn't really want to go back to Vienna immediately um, and instead I decided that I was going to study in England. And so I applied to do philosophy at the University of Oxford which was meant to have one of the best philosophy departments in England and I was accepted and so that's how I ended up there. The thing that first attracted me to philosophy was that I thought that philosophy was the kind of thing that would help you to learn how to think and 
that it is something that underlies all the other sciences and all the other fields of human thought. But I was also always interested in other more practical things, especially in politics and international relations. And I thought that having a philosophy, doing law and practicing as a lawyer for a while would eventually allow me to go and work for international organizations such as the European Union or the UN. And that's what I would like to do eventually. And that's why I'm now in London qualifying as a lawyer. The legal system in England is, is different from um, the legal system in, in a lot of other countries because it takes much less time to qualify as a lawyer. What you can do, in fact, is a law conversion course which takes only two years and then um, you work in a law firm for another two years until you're a qualified lawyer um, and in this period you're, you're known as a trainee solicitor and in most other countries it takes much longer to be a lawyer in Austria for example where I'm from it can take up to 10 years before you're a qualified lawyer the law firm I work for is an international firm which means that most of our clients are spread out all over the world and that in turn means that although officially I work from 9.30 to 6 p.m., um, inofficially I can be called on to work at any time, any day of the week, um, for at times very long periods of time. So normally I come into work at between 9 and 9.30, and um, I leave if there's nothing on at 6 p.m., or if there is something on, I can leave at 7, 8, 9, 10 p.m., or even few times at four or five in the morning, although that's admittedly rather rare. The, the work can be very interesting, and that depends on, on who you work for and, and what, what is happening at the time. Um, and the thing is that you sometimes work on matters which are in the newspapers, in the press, and so it's, it can be quite fascinating to be in the middle of this kind of highly pressured environment. Um, but of course it's the kind of thing that a lot of people only do for a few years when you're still young and you don't really have anything better to do with your life. Um, and I don't think I'll be doing it for the rest of my life, but as an experience, it's certainly, it's certainly interesting. In the two years that I'm working for this law firm, I'm going to work, for, um, work in four different legal areas. Um, so every six months I switch, and at least one of them has to be what is known as contentious law, which basically means the kind of law where there is a conflict between people and people go to court, um, which is something that people, that lawyers tend to either either love or hate. Um, I personally am very, find it very interesting because for some reason the idea of conflict and doing battle is something that appeals to me. But that's obviously a matter of personal preference. In, in February 2008, I'm actually going to be sent to Hong Kong for six months to, uh, to, work, to work there because my firm has, office, has an office there. After that, it I'm not entirely sure. It depends on whether or not my firm will want to keep me on. And if they do, then I, it is the likeliest outcome is that I'll be working in London or that I will stay in Hong Kong for a little while. But alternatively, it's also possible that I will, come, I will try and find, a work, find work with a different firm if there is a particular area of law I want to work in that I cannot do at my current firm or that I will try and make a move, make a, make, make a switch to, to an international organization, which is something I kind of want to do eventually anyway. But, um, maybe not straight away. I'm not sure if I want to come back to London or not. Um, London is a very interesting city, but it also has some disadvantages. It's very, very expensive. And um, it's, I find sometimes quite difficult to meet your friends there because it's so big that it can take a very long time just to get from one part of London to another. As far as working in the UK is concerned, I think, well, what I like is that in England, there seems to be a certain perception of fairness and the need to be fair in the workplace, which is something that I think you don't get in all countries, and something very nice. I think it's, I, I know quite a few people who are solicitors who are not native English speakers, but I, th I think you do need to have a good grasp of English. Um, I think lawyers need to be good with language, but it's certainly not impossible. And the advice I would give is just to, I mean, it can be a very rewarding profession, but it's also a, a profession that requires a lot of commitment. And you just need to be sure that you want to give it the kind of equipment that it requires. Because it takes years to train. You know, first you need to do a course, you need to do another course, then you need to work as a trainee for two years. Then you're then qualified. So it, it takes a long time and you just need to make sure that it's the right thing for you. Well, if I weren't doing this job, I think I, think I would like to be a lion tamer. It requires a lot of similar skills. Um, you need to deal with some very unpleasant creatures and people individuals and uh, you need to stay calm in, in, when there is a lot of pressure. 
All right. So I hope by now you are done with your exercise and you have answers for all the all the questions. Let me see how far you are right. Well, look at the very first question where you had to mark true and false. First one is false. He is currently qualifying as a lawyer. Second one is false too. He studied philosophy. However, third one is true. Fourth one is true too. And E, false, he believes they need to have a good grasp of English. Look at the second question. It's C. He moved to Australia with his, with his parents um, when he was 16. Third is B. He thought doing philosophy and law, as a matter of fact, would have, help, uh, would have helped him get a job with an international organization. Well, fourth one is C. In Austria, it can take up to 10 years before you are qualified liar, lawyers. Uh, um, lawyers and liars, you know, <laughs> and the difference between them. Whereas in the UK, you can do a two-year um, uh, conversion course followed by two years in a law firm to get qualified. Fifth question is A. Sometimes he works on matters that are in the newspapers. Um, sixth is B. He thinks it is quite difficult to meet his friends because the city is never is very big. Uh, so now uh, you need to take make take notes of um, the conventions which you may find grammatically um, uh, not right. Again, there are suggested suggested corrections. I train to be a solicitor. I am training to be a solicitor. Uh, uh, deal with clients immediately. In the first instance, face to face. Inofficially, I can be called upon unofficially. In the two years that uh, I'm working, I've been working. I'm going to, I'm going to, I will work for, to find a work, to find work. Make a switch, move to. So that was all about today's listening activity and with this we we reach the end of our uh, today's talk today's discussion and what we did covered in today's uh, uh, session was we had a memo workshop and we learned about the conventions strategies and practices of email writing one important reflector of uh, reflector in business technical documentation I'll see you in the next lecture it was all for today Allah Hafiz